Good evening, everyone. My name is Martin Cruz, Clinical Research Manager, and on behalf of Canon, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second week of our online oncology days. Last week, we discussed liver cancer in the field of diagnosis, treatment planning, image-guided treatment, and follow-up. And we had, a, we had a very interesting session on lung cancer screening, showing the results in the randomized screening trials this far, implementation of lung cancer screening in a mobile program, and the required CT technologies to offer personalized nodule management. Tonight's session will center imaging around kidney cancer. From new imaging techniques assessing malignancies to overcoming technical challenges in thermal ablation treatment, still discussing the best follow-up strategies. We have three great talks lined up and we will have time at the end for a discussion. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator and first speaker of this evening, Professor Jean-Michel Corias. Professor Corias is Professor of Radiology at the Paris Descartes University and is Vice Chairman of the Department of Adult Radiology at Necker University Hospital in Paris in France. Professor Corias is an expert in the interventional uroradiology domain and a real pioneer in the minimal invasive treatment for renal tumors and the ultra ultrasound guidance. Since 2002, he performed over 1,600 ablative procedures. So you can imagine, we are very happy he is here as the moderator and first speaker of the day. Professor Corias, today's session is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. It's a great pleasure to share our enthusiasm in uh, dealing with uh, renal lesions. And I will uh, share my screen so that uh, we can start now the presentation. So uh, again, uh, there are so many issues dealing with uh, uh, renal tumors. Uh, first of all, the very much increasing incidence of for uh, two to four person per year, and you see the numbers involved with the renal tumors. We unfortunately do not have any uh, prediction model for the risk of uh, renal tumor. We know some of the risk factors, but unfortunately there's no clear model for uh, detection or selecting a population at risk of uh, renal tumors. There's a very strong recommendation for nephron sparing management. This is including surgery and ablation. And you see the uh, high incidence of chronic kidney disease in the elderly population. The need for renal biopsy is increasing and you will see the uh, uh, clear value of ultrasound for guidance. And again, we will discuss a little bit of the minimally invasive percutaneous thermotherapy. So uh, uh, multi-parametric ultrasound is now uh, um, uh, combining the advantage of good B-mode and uh, tissue harmonic imaging, Doppler and micro-Doppler imaging, elastography and perfusion imaging. In the future, and this is exactly what we see, uh, is that we can combine the advantage of uh, ultrasound and MRI and multi-parametric MRI or CT, and this is just due to fusion imaging. Multi-parametric ultrasound is playing a key role for the assessment of renal masses. For the evaluation, first detection, localization, characterization, using contrast enhanced ultrasound, we can improve the characterization of the cystic renal masses and even uh, uh, discuss the differential, differential diagnosis. For renal biopsy, is an advantage of real-time guidance offering uh, the possibility of getting very complex oblique tracts and identification of non-necrotic tissues. Ultrasound is also helpful for staging the renal tumors and for percutaneous ablation for the needle or probe uh, placement. We can also use it for follow-up and evaluation of oncologic efficacy. Multiparametric ultrasound uh, is a combination of several imaging techniques, including uh, good uh, uh, tissue harmonic imaging, as you can see in these two uh, uh, running videos, where there's a clear cyst, but pay attention to this very small hypoechoic lesion. If you really uh, use a uh, conventional Doppler, you don't see any vascularity, but if you use uh, the uh, high resolution, very sensitive SMI techniques, you see that this is clearly not a, a cyst, but a, a renal tumor. And on the second case, this lesion that can 
be confused with this cystic, uh, um, typical cystic mass is in fact a solid uh, papillary carcinoma. So all of these techniques can be combined to improve the diagnosis of renal masses. But the first question is really, is this a solid or a cystic mass? And this is a critical question as a first step of characterization. We, can, we, we know the definition of enhancing mass at CT is a plus 20 Hounsfield unit uh, uh, comparing the baseline imaging and the contrast enhanced acquisition. For uh, indeterminate cystic masses, we use the Bosnia classification, but as, as a combination, we always need now to take into account the new uh, pathology, the new cancer types like uh, clear cell papillary carcinoma, cystic papillary carcinoma, carcinoma with the dematous stroma. And these tumors can have a very different behavior with uh, uh, conventional imaging techniques. At the end, the indeterminate renal masses remain as a lesion that cannot be categorized as benign or malignant with a confidence. The limits in characterization of so solid and cystic renal masses at CT and MRI result from uh, um, uh, oh, uh, are, are faced when we are dealing with uh, an incomplete diagnostic criteria, when the renal mass is very small, below eight millimeter, when the lesion is really sitting inside the parenchyma or when it's central, or in the presence of blood residue. As you can see in this example of this undeterminate uh, uh, lesion that is really a typical uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, cyst at uh, ultrasound looking at a very typical cyst. And then we can always use Bosnia classification. In this example, you see that how much uh, confidence can bring contrast enhanced ultrasound in analyzing the enhancement of these uh, cystic mass that really looked uh, as a two uh, Bosniak 2F or maybe three at uh, uh, CT and MRI, but really was uh, uh, much more suspicious of a renal cancer at contrast enhanced ultrasound. And the patient refused any treatment and came back one year later with uh, a pain. It was just due to bleeding. And you see that with bleeding, it is difficult for the conventional CT to detect any uh, specific enhancement. With MRI, we see the enhancing portions, but this is really obvious when we're using contrast enhanced ultrasound. And you see here the very large solid portions in the uh, cystic areas. In this other case of a woman that underwent a uh, left tumorectomy a few years ago, there's a, a new growing lesion that really appeared as a, a typical papillary carcinoma. It was uh, referred for percutaneous ablation. But just before the ablation, I was looking at it at uh, ultrasound and, and used contrast enhanced ultrasound because it was very difficult to see the position of the lesion and really looked like a, a typical uh, cyst. So we decided to perform MRI immediately uh, before ablation and uh, was not performed before due to severe claustrophobia. And you see that was truly a small hemorrhagic cyst. So we canceled the procedure. So this is just to bring you examples from the real life in characterization of the solid renal masses. And uh, Carlos Nicolau provided recently uh, this chart about how to uh, uh, manage uh, the diagnosis of these uh, renal solid re uh, lesions. The renal biopsy is now playing a growing uh, role for uh, the diagnosis and characterization of the lesion should be performed after informed consent of the patient. And you see that the performance of uh, uh, the biopsy is really good. Uh, the rate of failure is very low and can even identify the RCC subtypes. The complication rate is uh, really uh, limited. Of course, you should exclude the non-indication or contraindication, and mainly when there's no change in patient management, there's no reason to perform the renal biopsy. Uh, the uh, other uh, contraindication is just below. So the good indications are in the case of non-primary renal disease, uh, like patient presenting with a mass and uh, 
uh, hem, uh, blood disease, metastasis, infection or inflammation, when it can change the tumor management, of course, before active surveillance, percutaneous ablation, systemic therapy, and when the surgery is looking very difficult to eliminate a benign tumor. There's no point, there's no fight in between, you know, the guiding techniques. In our hands, we do prefer ultrasound for the real-time guidance, the very oblique tracks that we can achieve, and the real-time identification of the pleura. But when the mass is difficult to see, there's no question that CT is providing additional information when the lesion is deep and for the identification of the bowel structures. Let's see a few examples of these uh, 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 biopsy. And in the first case, um, you see that the lesion, uh, the needle is going directly to the tumor and it, it, it looks very easy procedure. In this second case, uh, uh, the lesion is much deeper and is sitting inside a cyst. And this is a, a Bosniak 4 lesion, but very deep lesion. So uh, the biopsy is really performed under a continuous imaging guidance. And uh, we can even biopsy very small lesion below one centimeter when needed uh, in the patient with a unique uh, kidney, functioning kidney with a very high uh, efficacy. In the case of necrotic lesions, uh, we should target the enhancing portion and contrast enhanced ultrasound can be really helpful for identification of these mural nodules or uh, for the non-necrotic parts and we can really stick the needle right in place. Fusion imaging is a new tool that can help, you know, uh, identification of the lesion. And you see that on the top, the uh, tumor is very difficult to see at uh, uh, ultrasound while it looks obvious at CT. And uh, it is also uh, helpful to take advantage of both techniques, ultrasound, CT, or MRI. However, for kidney, it's a very challenging um, application because there are variable position or plans before uh, between uh, CT, MRI, and ultrasound. It should be available for any of the ultrasound modalities, and it's a, a very complex situation because the movement of the kidney with breathing is not a simple translation, it's a 3D displacement. So we can use single or uh, multiple electromagnetic or optical sensors that we can stick on the screen, on the skin to uh, improve the uh, fusion uh, technology. For ablation, you can see that on the very recent guidelines coming from the Asia, from Asia, ultrasound and contrast enhanced ultrasound are now appearing in the checklist. Recently, the American uh, Urological Association considered thermal ablation in a very much open way than in the previous guidelines. And basically, they recognize that. Uh, Ablation is providing uh, similar oncologic results with a much lower morbidity, including less blood transfusion, no uh, radical nephrectomy, quicker recovery, similar complication rate, reduced duration of hospital stay, quicker procedure, reduced dose of anesthetic drugs. And this can be also performed under conscious sedation. So it's a very uh, powerful technique that uh, can play a key role in the management of renal tumors. In our experience, uh, we uh, mainly use radiofrequency ablation for the smaller lesion when the peripheral, cryoablation when the lesions are much larger and or central, and microwave ablation in between these two uh, typical uh, situations. Uh, let's see a few cases of a uh, this is a very difficult situation in, in a patient, young patient with a recurrent papillary carcinoma. And you see that the lesion is really central and ultrasound and uh, Doppler ultrasound was very critical for identification of the best track. And you can see the needle getting right inside the tumor and the pre and post ablation MRI showing first the, uh, the efficacy of the procedure and the lack of loss of uh, normal renal tissue. 
In this patient with a renal transplant and a severe chronic kidney disease, uh, you see uh, that, uh, and, and this patient had a, a multiple history of acute pyelonephritis, there was a mass that was considered as a beginning to be a, a, maybe an abscess, but with contrast enhanced ultrasound, we completely changed the diagnosis. And this was really a typical renal tumor uh, that was uh, confirmed by MRI. But we uh, did perform ablation with microwave and fusion procedure. You see the needle getting in uh, the, uh, uh, at the place of the tumor and you see the ablation result before ablation and after ablation with almost no change in the renal function. And um, finally, uh, I hope that I demonstrated uh, that multiparametric ultrasound is playing a key role at each step of, of the renal tumor management, including detection and characterization, renal biopsy and staging, percutaneous ablation, and follow-up. Uh, this is, uh, for me, the, the, the only case of a Bosniak-1 cyst that uh, was referred for ethanol uh, ablation uh, because of pain. And I did perform the contrast-enhanced ultrasound just before injecting the ethanol. And uh, uh, I, I detected some uh, 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 the septation here was really uh, highly vascular and decided not to perform uh, the injection of ethanol, refer the patient to um, MR, and you see that there's almost nothing abnormal. However, the patient was uh, uh, operated with a, a partial nephrectomy that confirmed the presence of a, a RCC, a low-grade RCC. So you see, we can even identify Bosniak-1 cyst as a, a renal cell carcinoma. So, um, the key point, however, is really to get excellent BMO imaging and, and the training that we all require when we do uh, ultrasound and uh, ultrasound guided procedures. Thank you very much. So um, maybe now uh, it's time to introduce uh, uh, Carlos Abad. It, it's a great pleasure for me. Um, uh, Carlos uh, has a, a degree in medicine from the Federal University of Pernambuco with a medical residency in uh, radiology at the Radiological Center of Brasilia, a specialization in vascular and interventional radiology at Medimagen at the Hospital of uh, Beneficenza Portuguesa in Sao Paulo, and in therapeutic neuroradiology at the Fondation Rothschild in Paris, and uh, I'm sure his French is, is pretty good. He holds the title of a specialist of interventional radiology and endovascular surgery at the Brazilian Society of Interventional Radiology and in Diagnostic and Therapeutic Neuroradiology. He's a full member of the World Federation of Interventional and Therapeutic Neuroradiology and of the Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiology Society of Europe. So thank you very much, Carlos, for joining. And it's great pleasure to leave you uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Correa, for your kind introduction. I'd like also to thanks to Ken for this invitation, for this exciting uh, webinar with two very distinguished uh, European colleagues. I will talk about the state of art of the renal cancer treatment. My disclosure, I, I would like to say that it's not a personal test, but a teamwork, especially my partner Gustavo and Marilia. And <clears throat> We know that 3% of all cancer in adults are renal cancer, and this incidence is increasing in the recent years. And now that we are using more image diagnosis, uh, we are detecting more smaller renal tumor. And so around 60% are incidental, they are found as incidental finding. Then here we have the classification of tumor, and the tumor that we are interested in treating with ablation is that small tumor uh, classified T1A, uh, no metastasis, and, and this is our goal. For this, for this type of tumor in this, at this stage, uh, some people advise active radiological surveillance. It could, could be done also open radical nephrectomy. In our day, less and less this kind of, of, of the radical surgery. And, at, at least here in Brazil, the most useful use of the treatment is the partial nephrectomy by laparoscopy. And some, 
Some hosts are doing robot, but the majority are lapar laparoscopic surgery. Then on the other side, we have the ablation. And the ablation, you can do the ablation with uh, radio frequency, cryoablation, uh, microwaves, or electroporation. Why to do ablation for this, this tumor? First of all, because the nephrectomy is not so simple, uh, mainly in central tumors, and, and also because it will have complication up to 33%, and there is a steep learning curve for the surgeon. On the other side, ablation is a good alternative. It's a image guided procedure. Doing this procedure, we have almost no reduction in the, in the renal function. So I think this is the best example of the nephro sparing concept. We have the, the heat-based uh, uh, energy. We have the, the, the radio frequency. The radio frequency is a frequential reading caused by the, the radio frequency interacting with the tissues. The cells that die at 60 Celsius degree. It, there is much more polyps scientific evidence with this kind of technique because this was the first technique to be used in the renal tumors. On the other side, microwave ablation is another kind of electromagnetic radiation. There is cellular dextrusion by water molecules heating and is, is faster and you can achieve a larger ablation, ablation zone. <clears throat> On the other side, we have the cold base energy that we call cryoablation. It's a cooling of gas argon. There is tumor cell dextrusion at minus 20 degrees. There is a nice ball formation under image guide, and you can see here the, the, the ice ball, and this is more precise to, to, to determine the, the zone of ablation. We can see the, the, the treatment margin of, of safety. And we try to see to, to, to follow this kind of, of planning algorithm that was developed by Mayo Clinic. We try to, to treat more small tumors. We, we try to avoid burn the, the bower doing hydro dissection. <clears throat> we prefer the lesions that are located the nodules in the poles and more posterior is better. Uh, we try to protect also the ureter. We try also to protect the, the renal sinus. And in this case, we prefer to use the cryoablation. And we prefer also the exophyt lesion instead of the endophyt lesions. Here, one example of the best indication, the easier case is a male with left partial nephrectomy. And there is a small tumor, a peripheral one, exophic one in the inferior pole, then it's very easy. And as Professor Correa said, we always do before uh, a biopsy. We put first the probe of radio frequency. And after we put, do the biopsy, because if you do the biopsy first, we can have bleeding and this can in some way uh, difficult to the, uh, the placement of the probe. In this case, we did the uh, hydro dissection, and here's the final result of the ablation. We use microwave in bigger nodule and peripheral bigger nodule. It's, it's faster than the, the radio frequency. <clears throat> it's an, uh, an example of a case. We have here um, a big lesion. We did a biopsy, but without pathology at the room, the, the result came after. There is the history of surgical indication for open radical nephrectomy, but the patient refused. Then we decided to do biopsy, hydro dissection, and microwaves. Then in this big tumor, we did a plan like this because one probe is not possible to treat all the volume of the tumor. Then we put probe at three different levels achieving this kind of result here. Here we can see the CT, the kind of result. And the result of the, the histopathology, here is the tumor, a good ablation, immediate result. And here the result was on, in opositoma. The cryoablation, <coughs> this is an example of cryoablation, a more central lesion here. We have here a, an MRI, we did a CT guided cryoablation. In this case, we were a little bit afraid of the proximity to, to the bowel. Then we did a hydro dissection. Here's the probe, the first probe. Then after this, because of this close to ureter, we did also, and also because of the proximity to the renal sinus, 
we did a pneumo hydro dissection, like you can see here. And we decided to treat with two probes. Then we have two probes in parallel. And now we can see the result, immediate result, and the, the six months follow up with MR, showing a very good result with preservation of all the, the, the structures around the, the tumor. We have, as a recent developed, the elect irreversible electroporation. We don't have here in our department yet, we, but this is a non thermal ablative technology with short, high voltage electrical energy that permeabilizes the cell membrane. It's not uh, an, uh, because of hot or cold, it's a different kind of, of cell destruction. And the big advantage is to preserve the normal adjacent structures then we can potentially use this in central tumor and close to the ureter. Then this is a case that uh, we just faced some weeks ago. Here's a central tumor, a small one, and we intend to do our first case in May when we will receive a, a reversible electroporation equipment. Here is, the, is our hybrid room that we dedicated to all our procedural intervention radiology. We do intervention at the vast and the radiology in the department. It's our famous 4D CT from Kennel. And I think this is a very, very helpful uh, facility because we can join in just one room all intervention technique as CT, ultrasound, fluoroscopy, and angiography. All of this inside a sterile surgical ambience. Uh, dealing with training team for complex procedures, good anesthetists, and we use fluoroscopy. Uh, we have a fluoroscopy for do procedures with CT guided procedure. I, I will give some examples. We can also do immediate arterial embolization when we have vascular complication with bleeding, and and sometimes we associate ablation plus embolization for achieve a better result in select case, of course. The, here's an example of, a, of a, a tumor of three centimeters that fed inferior and, and medial pole, proximal to inferior callus and ureter. Then we intend to do nephrostomy and PL lateral irrigation, hydrodissection, and after this, radio frequency ablation. Then in this equipment, we can do by nephrostomy function and nephrostomy with, with using ultrasound or in this case, using fluoroscopy. Is a normal non dilated uh, PLO calicial system. We put a guide wire, we, did, we do the nephrostomy. And after this, we do the ureteral, here the ureter, we did a dissection, pneumo, pneumo hydro dissection to protect the ureter. And here is the, the Q tip uh, radio frequency ablation, the immediate result at two different levels. And here, the 10 months follow up with preservation of ureter and the, and the renal sinus. This is a good advantage. It's not a renal case. It was a pancreatic mass uh, biopsy, a difficult one, shelling case, biopsy, but here the biopsy needle. And at the immediate control, we can see here a false aneurysm, uh, uh, an important bleeding. And immediately we put in the, in the, in the in geography mode, we did an angiography, renal angiography, and you can see here a small extravasation of contrast. We did a, a, a selective catheterization of, of, of this image, and this is the inferior phrenic artery, and we put some coil and we solved the problem immediately without no clinical consequence. We can do also pre-ablation embolization. It's beneficial in selected cases, not the, the whole, but you can use it. We can use these more enlarged tumors, uh, where several punctures are needed when they are hyper hypervascularized in elderly patient with a higher risk of hemorrhage then we can combine embolization and after ablation and we have to be cautious in patient with a bad renal function because this will add use of contrast and can deteriorate the renal function this is an example here we have the tumor uh, is a big tumor for to be more than four centimeters Exophytic is a patient is a Jehovah witness patient, then it's not possible to do blood transfusion. Then we decide to do embolization and microwave because of the size of the tumor. Here is the angiography. We can see in the upper pole exophytic uh, hypervascularized lesion. 
here we can see the the control immediate control of, uh, after embolization with particles with spheres here is the final control with the vascularization of the lesion and at the same time the same room the same equipment we change the mode for CT and put the probe and to do the different level, different position. We do, we did microwaves ablation with hydro dissection to, pro, to protect the, the bowel and also the spleen. So I would say that nephrosparagine surgery must, must be used for the small tumors. Henel ablation is a guide nephrosparagine procedure with less morbidity than partial nephrectomy. Special attention should be paid to nodules close to the pielorateral system. Hydropneumon dissection by pielorateral irrigation must be done whenever necessary. Uh, radiofrequency microwave and preablation are currently used according to the clinical case. Electroporacy is a promising tool for central lesions. And hybrid CT angel suite provides more efficiency and safety for the procedure. Thank you very much. So uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Catherine Roy, and uh, she's a professor of radiology and graduated from the University of Strasbourg. Uh, she has been a fellow resident in radiology during one year at the University of Montreal in different subspecialties of uh, radiology. She started her career in uh, Strasbourg in the field of Euroradiology, and she's a member of the European Society of Euroradiology and the past president of the French group of Euroradiology named Sigu for more than uh, 10 years. She has been promoted at the chair of uh, the Department of Radiology in Strasbourg, and she's involved in many teaching courses in the field of Euro uh, oncology. Thank you very much for Catherine for giving this talk. Thank you, Jean-Michel, for your kind introduction. It's a, a great pleasure to be here with you to share some information concerning the role of the CT and the diagnosis and follow-up of patients with kidney carcinoma. Just before going on with the CT, a quick background information. You can see that uh, uh, the renal carcinoma is relatively uncommon. Uh, it accounts for 7% seven, 7 of cases uh, of the global cancer diagnosis. But interestingly, its incidence has dramatically improved in our country in the past two decades, mainly due to the fact that most cases are nowadays discovered incidentally on an imaging uh, perform for another purpose, most often a CT or an uh, uh, ultrasound. So that uh, the size of the lesion has dramatically de decreased and the mean size is nowadays around four centimeters. Uh, the second point is that uh, the stage uh, shift towards a less aggressive lesion and of course a better prognosis. And you can see on this diagram that if it is a localized uh, localized lesion, the survival rate is quite good, up to 90% of cases. The initial treatment is a surgery, and uh, there is an emerging uh, treatment, uh, which is the percutaneous ablation uh, previously developed by uh, previous speakers. And only 10 to 20% of patients initially uh, arrived in our department with a large uh, advanced tumoral process. Obviously, and there is no doubt of, about that, the CT is really the routine gold standard technique for the kidney cancer, and I have divided my talk between two parts, the diagnosis and detection, and the follow-up after a surgery in the context of oncologic disease. The advance in the technology has dramatically improved by using the deep learning reconstruction, the image quality, in addition to a reduction of the radiation dose. And we have calculated in our department that the radiation dose has decreasing of, uh, between 35 to 45% with this uh, new deep learning reconstruction, depending on the type of examination. And in the context of uh, 
follow-up of oncologic patients, is, it is really essential to reduce the radiation dose because those patients receive uh, many, many CT examinations. Just a, a, a quick uh, example to show you how ACE has uh, modified the image quality. This is the same patient in the context uh, of uh, a follow-up after a uh, tumoral process. A first examination was performed uh, uh, in 2018 with AEDR 3D, and he received uh, uh, another examination later uh, with ACE. And you can, uh, it is the same, it was the same uh, protocol for acquisition. And you can see that the image we say is dramatically better, more sharp, with less noise. And we are able to uh, detect small details, as you can see here, this small cyst is perfectly seen. And if we uh, look at the radiation dose, you can see that definitively it's quite better. And we have reduced the dose of around 30, 35% uh, for this patient. The second uh, new technology and advance in the new technology is the spectral imaging. You know that uh, this acquisition has the ability to increase the contrast. And as most common uh, renal carcinoma, hypervascular lesion, it, it is very interesting to use it uh, in the detection as well as in the follow-up after surgery. If your device has no uh, spectral imaging, you have a kind of substitute which is a sur substraction, but uh, be careful, uh, you will obtain less information. We will discuss this at the end of the talk. Uh, concerning the spectral imaging, my feeling is that uh, this uh, software provides two types of information. First, you will have uh, to explore the monochromatic images, uh, meaning to better see the abnormality. The image quality is nowadays very, very good, as you have here a set uh, of uh, uh, arterial phase, portal phase, and excretory phase to show how the image quality is uh, uh, perfect. So that it's better to detect abnormalities. And uh, it is uh, essential, in my opinion, to, scroll, to scroll through the KIV, to decrease a little bit the KIV. Uh, for instance, in this case, uh, 75 to uh, 60 KIV to increase the contrast in the, in the kidney and potentially better obtain a better detection of an abnormalities. Uh, the consequence of that is yes, uh, you are able uh, to uh, use a low yielding load a contrast agent and uh, uh, all our patients in the context of follow-up, we use this type of contrast agent and we obtain an excellent uh, uh, contrast enhancement. Concerning the radiation dose, uh, initially the spectral acquisition uh, uh, gave a high radiation dose of, it was too high, but now with the addition of haze available on the spectral, uh, the radiation dose is uh, similar to that obtained previously with the conventional uh, reconstruction. Uh, in this paper published uh, uh, four years before, it has been postulated that uh, the best threshold uh, is 70, 70 kV to uh, obtain the, a good uh, uh, characterization of the renal lesion. But in my opinion, I, I'm not in agreement with it because I, I think that it is really essential to move through the KIV to better detect the abnormality. Concerning the diagnosis and the detection, the CT is able to detect small lesion, uh, mean size, uh, more or uh, even less, uh, a bit less, uh, five millimeters. And the protocol is uh, common. There is no uh, ambiguity about this. Uh, three or four cases with spectral, you need only four. Uh, phases, arterial, tubular, and excretory phase, depending on the case. 
the pattern for the diagnosis is an announcement uh, between the non-injected uh, uh, acquisition and the injection up to equal to 20 unsfield units. But be uh, uh, careful. It means that there is a, a soft tissue in the lesion, it's a solid lesion, but it doesn't mean it is benign or malignant. If we look at uh, uh, the uh, result of the conventional uh, uh, acquisition, uh, the mean negative point of the conventional CT is that there is a todo enhancement, especially when there is a small lesion uh, inside the kidney parenchyma. And uh, the enhancement is uh, commonly up to 20 unsfield units, as you can see in those examples, and it's really a very tiny cyst inside the renal uh, parenchyma, it's not uh, at all a tumoral process, even if the uptake seems to be up to uh, uh, 20 unsfield units. When it is really up uh, to uh, 20, it's most frequently a malignant lesion, and it is below, we don't know. And when the patient and the tumoral process present <coughs> calcification, most often it's a malignant lesion. Now, if we uh, look at the spectral acquisition, the second information you can obtain with the uh, spectral acquisition is to use a uh, multiple tools available to uh, better characterize and to quantify the lesion. You will have to use the yielding map, the VNC, the effective Z, and uh, you can obtain uh, the spectral curve after uh, the elimination of a region of interest. Concerning the VNC, uh, uh, you will obtain uh, a, an image without any contrast, even if your acquisition has been performed with a contrast injection. And it has been recently published that you can avoid the conventional non-contrast acquisition and you will decrease the radiation dose of uh, your exploration by using uh, the spectral imaging. And concerning the value uh, of a useful unit obtained on uh, the uh, VNC, it has been uh, clearly demonstrated that it is quite similar to those obtained on the uh, non-injected conventional acquisition less than 10 uh, unsfield units you will obtain an additional information. You can quantify the yielding load. Uh, it's uh, an information quite different from that obtained within the field unit. And the threshold in the literature to prove that there is an enhancement is between 0.5 to uh, 1 uh, milligram per milliliter. You can obtain very easily a spectral curve. And where you can see here, when you decrease uh, you scroll through the KIV by decreasing the level, uh, there is uh, really a, a high intensity, a high level of unsfield unit, meaning that uh, really there is an uptake of uh, uh, a iodine agent. And in addition, there is no or almost no uh, third enhancement with the type of acquisition. Concerning the quantification of the effective Z and the electronic density, in my opinion, it's nowadays, it, it, it remains in the field of research. But there is a negative point. You must uh, avoid to explore an, an, uh, an, <clears throat> a patient, uh, an overweighted patient, because you will have a very high intensity uh, of radiation dose and the image quality was uh, disappointed. Just a quick uh, example to show you how, how it is interesting to characterize a small lesion using uh, the spectral acquisition. It was a, a patient uh, who presented two small lesions. We are in the excretory phase in the left kidney. And by using the yielding map, the VNC, the spectral curve, the effective Z, I am sure that uh, the blue one is only a simple cyst. You can see on the VNC the value of the useful unit. 
And the yellow one is a small tumoral process, which was a small papillary tumoral process. So only one examination with one injection, uh, and you are sure uh, that uh, you can differentiate between a simple cyst, small cyst, and a, a small tumoral process. It's the same thing for hemorrhagic cyst. But uh, all uh, soft tissue masses are not uh, malignant. And uh, there are around 20% of uh, small uh, tumoral process, solid process, uh, uh, which are uh, benign lesion. With two ma main types of uh, uh, benign lesion, uh, the most common is the angiomolipoma, and less common is uh, the oncocytoma. Commonly, the angiomolipoma uh, present a large amount of fat, so it's very easy to be sure of this diagnostic, and you don't need any spectral acquisition for this. Sometimes, angiomolipoma, around 5% of angiomolipoma, present uh, no visible fat or are called poor fat. And in those cases, it's becoming more difficult to uh, differentiate uh, them from uh, 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 renal uh, tumoral, malignant tumoral process. Uh, it's the same thing for cositoma. You have here a list of uh, some arguments uh, to uh, evoke the diagnosis of angiomolipoma low fat and ococytoma. You can see that uh, those lists are uh, very long, meaning that the diagnosis is not so easy. An interesting pattern for the angiomolipoma low fat is what we call the highs ball, uh, meaning there is a sharp interface between uh, the lesion and the kidney parenchyma you can see here. Uh, the specificity and predictive positive value was in, in theory around five, uh, 100 is by you know, a little bit high, but it's an interesting pattern. And if you look at the uh, acquisition with or with an injection, if you are able to uh, perform an histogram, if you have uh, some uh, negative Unsfield unit, uh, you can suppose that it is an angiomolipoma, even in some cases of renal carcinoma uh, present uh, such abnormality, but in angiomolipoma, there is no calcification. Concerning the ococytoma, after contrast medium injection, the most interesting pattern is not the homogeneous enhancement. It is what we call the segmental enhancement inversion, meaning that if you look at this example, uh, there is on the arterial phase an intense and homogeneous enhancement of the soft tissue and the central scar uh, uh, is uh, hypo-intense. And uh, on the delayed phase, there is an uptake of the central scar. And it's easy to perform the differential diagnosis with the central necrosis of a renal cell carcinoma. Concerning the uh, malignant kidney tumoral process, there are three major types and uh, with different uh, patterns. Uh, very commonly, uh, diagnosis is most commonly easy to perform. Uh, the clear cell carcinoma has an early heterogeneous enhancement. The papillary type is a, has a low uh, progressive uh, homogeneous enhancement, and the chromophobic type, which is less common, has a moderate early enhancement. It has been aussi, also uh, uh, published recently that uh, spectral imaging is able to differentiate because the homophobic uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma and the papillary type, but in my opinion, it doesn't matter because all those uh, lesions are malignant and they need uh, 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 treatment. Uh, concerning the ablation uh, by surgery, uh, it is essential to provide, especially as the surgeon will perform a partial surgery for a small tumoral process or a medium-sized tumoral process to uh, provide a precise localization uh, of the lesion with extension to the sinus and to detect the variation of the vascular anatomy, which are so common around the 30% of cases. 
you need also to provide uh, uh, the extension to adjacent organ and as uh, a very common and uh, 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 very frequent metastatic uh, uh, synchronous extension inside uh, the adrenal gland and pancreas. The control lateral kidney is involved in around 10% of cases. And concerning the involvement of renal cava, which is a typ typical uh, aspect of renal cell carcinoma, in my opinion, the CT is not the best uh, examination. MR is certainly more efficient uh, as well as the uh, uh, ultrasonography because of the two uh, uh, artifacts, many, many artifacts of flu artifact. It was a sub example to uh, Uh, to uh, show you a case of planification for partial surgery performed with spectral. Even if we are able to provide uh, uh, such beautiful and impressive uh, reconstruction with a global illumination rendering, I am always uh, disappointed because my surgeon uh, considers uh, uh, that the information is better assessed uh, on the uh, conventional and uh, very common uh, 2D oblique reconstruction. But if you use a spectral acquisition, uh, it is interesting because you will obtain a, a, a constant evaluation with a good contrast in the arterial phase, of course, and as well in the uh, vascular, uh, in the venous uh, uh, evaluation. So it's very interesting to use it to obtain a good contrast in the uh, both uh, uh, vessels. Here is another example to show you a, a pre uh, planification for partial surgery. This patient, uh, uh, this lesion was discovered uh, incidentally uh, on a CT for back pain. And by scrolling through the KIV, we are able to be sure that there is an extension inside the sinus, you can see here, and probably inside uh, the initial part of the vein here. And it is really a contraindication uh, to the partial surgery. You can also assess it uh, uh, on the yielding map. So that I think really that it is essential to move through the KIV to better uh, detect and prove that there is an abnormality. Another case uh, obtained uh, uh, before a potential uh, surgery, and you can see that there is a large tumoral process. This uh, patient presented a macroscopic hematuria with invasion of the sinusal part. But on the uh, delayed phase, uh, by scrolling through the KIV, we are able to uh, be sure and to detect that there was an involvement in the par uh, posterior parietal uh, muscle here. And the surgeon uh, was very uh, happy to see that before the surgery. This patient was initially uh, treated by chemotherapy. And if you have time uh, in your department, Uh, you can also uh, propose a such reconstruction to calculate the volume of the uh, tumoral process and the volume of the supposed uh, remaining uh, uh, kidney. As you can see, uh, it's the software used for the liver, but it works quite well uh, for the kidney. Now, concerning the follow-up after uh, surgery, uh, there are uh, several prognosis factors, the stage, the grade, the size, the cellular type, and uh, several prognosis systems have been uh, elaborated. Uh, but uh, you must uh, know that even uh, if there is uh, some stage in those prognosis system, uh, the evolution uh, is often unpredictable. And if you use the spectral uh, to uh, explore those patients, you can be, uh, have a better evaluation for an enhancement to diagnose the metastasis or to be confident to eliminate a metastatic disease. A recent paper has also demonstrated that by uh, the addition of the information of the uh, uh, iodine concentration 
and the uh, quantification of effective uh, uh, Z, uh, it can be an additional predictor factor uh, for the evolution and the survival rate of the patient. Just uh, an example, this, is patient, this patient underwent a partial surgery uh, previously, and uh, there was a, a loss of weight, and uh, a CT examination was performed. And uh, sometimes on the conventional acquisition, it's very difficult to be sure that there is no announcement really in it. If you use a spectral acquisition, the loading map, is a spectral curve, you can prove that in this part, there is no recurrency at all. And the last example, uh, this patient pr uh, present other a partial surgery uh, some uh, previously. And a first examination was performed six weeks before uh, with a conventional acquisition. Uh, honestly, we missed this small lesion. But later, the, the next examination was performed with a spectral acquisition. And uh, uh, similar to the other cases, by moving through the KIV, uh, the pancreatic metastasis uh, is uh, obviously well evaluated uh, in this uh, part of the pancreas. So uh, spectral is very interesting. If you are uh, poor, I'm sorry to say that, uh, if you have no spectral acquisition on your CT device, you can use a subtraction. Uh, it is uh, as uh, named a subtraction between non-contrast and contrast and addition uh, with uh, uh, called sur subtraction. It is a, an entirely automatic process. It doesn't take no more than a three to five minutes, and there is no impact on the workflow. And we will obtain such such uh, images with a. Uh, perfect deviation of the border of the kidney without brewing at all. If you use it in the specific context of the follow-up of kidney carcinoma, uh, if you correlate this, the, the acquisition with uh, the sur-substraction, you can be sure that in this part, there is nothing at all and there is no uptake of contrast agent. Uh, in this case, uh, this patient has a several cyst, a renal cyst, and uh, on the right uh, uh, kidney, you can be sure that there is no, no announcement in this part, and it's an hemorrhagic cyst. But on the left kidney, there was a, a, a tech uh, of contrast agent, and you can detect a, a small uh, tumoral process. But be careful, there is no quantification is only uh, to better see uh, an announcement or be sure there is no announcement. The last case is a patient uh, in the context of after a nephrectomy, uh, there is a, a, a recurrency in the left uh, perirenal uh, space here. And uh, when a, a metastasis, bone metastasis, you can see clearly here. But if we scroll through the, uh, the examination, I, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm, I, I am sure, sorry, that uh, it was not possible to be to detect this small bone metastasis uh, uh, on the simple acquisition. So to conclude uh, with this topic, I guess that in the context of uh, renal carcinoma, there are uh, two highlight features uh, in the diagnosis and the follow-up, which are uh, ACE. Uh, with the spectral uh, acquisition, a good image quality, an acceptable uh, radiation dose, and of course, a better evaluation and better screening before uh, treatment. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for both of you. A very nice presentation. And uh, um, I'm just waiting to see, but maybe while uh, questions are appearing now in the Q&A section, uh, I can ask Carlos. Um, uh, Carlos, is, uh, the equipment is really impressive. And uh, how often uh, would you expect to use a combined uh, uh, approach uh, with the hybrid uh, uh, technology? Thank you for the question. Uh, 
I don't use in the regular case. I mean, the small nodule with the exophytic one. I did this with CT guidance without the fluoroscopy, but I use it first of all as a backup for complication. And then if, if you do a biopsy, we have some kind of complication, mainly complication related to, to bleeding that you detect in the, in the CT and in the control, we are very comfortable to put a, a catheter, but the patient is already on the table and to embolize it. And this is the first thing. The second one is for that case that they are not the usual indication for ablation. I mean, large tumors, hypervascularized tumor, elderly patient because they can bleed more. The, then in this case, we do sometimes the embolization before the ablation to have a better result to the ablation and also to avoid complication. And another good case is when you have to use fluoroscopy just to do uh, nephrostomy. When it's dilated, you can use ultrasound, but in non dilate uh, system, I personally prefer to do by fluoroscopy, then it's very useful also. And it was the other tumor like, like kidney is a different issue. I use in almost every case I use it, but this difference more to detect a small tumor that I cannot see in the normal CT. Then they do a CT with intra-arterial injection and then we are more sensitive to detect this image. But in kidney, this is not a, a I have never tried this because it is already come with the diagnosis from the CT or the MRI. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh... Maybe I have a, a question for uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, what is the best indication for using a spectral uh, a CT in the assessment of uh, renal masses? It's uh, uh, mainly uh, when it is a, a small tumor process and uh, uh, around four centimeters and the surgeon need to perform a partial uh, surgery uh, laparoscopic or by robot. And you need a precise, very precise evaluation, especially uh, a good information concerning arteries and vein to better uh, perform the uh, ablation. Okay, thank you. And, and you think that these technique will uh, uh, improve the differentiation between uh, uh, malignant and, and benign tumors at the end? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, there is in the literature only one paper uh, to prove that it could be possible, but with the addition of a mathematical model, very, very complicated. So uh, I guess that really the biopsy and the clinical routine biopsy is certainly the best option. I'm not sure that spectral or conventional imaging can, uh, the spectral can improve this. Uh, kind of differential diagnosis. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, I, I, can, I can say that uh, I share your uh, opinion uh, right now, but uh, we will see more in the future with the uh, advanced uh, CT modes. Uh, uh, but this is a very exciting, uh, uh, you know, uh, word. Um, I don't see any question appearing. Maybe I can ask one more to... Uh, uh, Carlos, Carlos, mm. don't are, are you not afraid to uh, uh, perform embolization in the case of previous to uh, ablation and uh, mm -hmm. affect the renal function? Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, doctor, if the tumor is small, maybe it's not necessary to do just this. But if the, the tumor is big, we can do with very small amount of of contrast indeed, and then you can, it's not a big deal, but you have to be aware of this, not to use too much contrast that you not add so many things, and but they can uh, uh, harm the patient, just this, but I agree with you, it's not a big issue, you can use the majority of patients can use it. Um, I have a question that is coming from the floor. Uh, do you see a future for thermal ablation treatment in a tumor larger than three centimeter? And the second part is, is the image guidance in ultrasound or and CT sufficient to overcome possible complications? So first one is, do uh, you see a future for thermal ablation for the larger tumors? This is for me, this question? Yes, this is for you. Okay. okay. 
I think so. I think so because you know, first you have to prove that our our job work in specific case. As we be, are becoming more confident, at, and we be, and the technology evolve, I think we began to do case that the, for some reason the patient is not op operable, or case where the patient refused the surgery, like Jehovah uh, Witness patients. And you try and you do the case that I have done case like this with four centimeters and you have quite good result. Then I think we will have more and more cases uh, out of the, the, the best indication that we will begin to do in the future. I think so. Okay, I share totally your uh, vision. And I think that uh, in the future, uh, we will probably get similar oncological efficacy, even in the larger tumors, probably in the three to four, maybe five centimeter. Of course, the larger the tumor, the more difficult it is to achieve a very uh, mm -hmm. uh, complete enhancement of the temperature, increase of the temperature or freezing in the very homogeneous freezing in the entire uh, tumor. But uh, um, it is clear that with a, a complication rate that is three to five times lower than surgery, mm -hmm. uh, there's always a, a, a possibility and uh, in mm -hmm. opportunity to use the ablation techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a question for Catherine uh, coming from the floor. What is the difference between dual energy iodine maps and subtraction iodine maps? And which one is clinically significant? Uh, it's, it's really quite different. Uh, the dual energy uh, yielding map is uh, the consequence of a spectral acquisition, which is uh, an acquisition very, very different. When you use a subtraction, it's only a conventional acquisition, and uh, there is a software with an addition and subtraction. You need to add a known uh, injected acquisition before, and there is an extraction of the yielding component and the, the image obtained is added to uh, the image obtained with uh, uh, acquisition with uh, uh, contrast uptake. So you increase the contrast. And when uh, there is no announcement, uh, you, you can be sure that there is uh, no announcement. There is no pseudo announcement. This, I if I can say, but there is no quantification. It's only to look at the, the, the slides, uh, that's it. There is no quantification at all. In the dual energy, you can obtain different information, quantification, yielding map, uh, you can obtain use field unit and so on. It's not, uh, it's not possible of the uh, subtraction. You can only visually assess if there is an uptake of contrast agent or not. Yes, I totally agree. So there's a question, uh, another one, the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound uh, during ablation to monitor immediate response. So uh, I can share with you my opinion and uh, we uh, published a few years ago a study uh, using CUS for uh, immediate evaluation of ablation. Unfortunately, you should remember that uh, during ablation, there is a quite a significant amount of gas deposition in the tissue. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you can even see it at CT, but uh, it, it's uh, obscuring the area of ablation. So uh, before doing contrast enhanced ultrasound immediately after ablation, you should wait at least, at least 10 to 15 minutes just to get rid of these uh, bubble cloud. Um, the key point is that in some situations, some of the bubbles will remain and still uh, um, induce attenuation. So it will mask the possible uh, residual enhancing tumor. So um, at the beginning, I was performing uh, CUS uh, immediately after ablation or within the 10 to 20 minutes after ablation. And uh, I gave up uh, because I was not comfortable with these uh, um, attenuation issues. So uh, I think it uh, uh, could be a promising technique, but we should uh, find a way to get signals, even in the case of uh, remaining bubbles or attenuating bubbles from the uh, procedure. 
Um, an, another question may be coming uh, also from the floor. Um, is the image guidance in ultrasound or CT sufficient to overcome possible complications? Maybe, Carlos, you can uh, uh, reply. Thank you. Uh, I honestly, I think in this case that fortunately they are rare for people that have skill to do this. But I think we had a risk complication, mainly bleeding complication. In general, it's quite hard to take the patient from the diagnosis radiology department and take to the intervention uh, radiology department. Then there is a Korean study that showed that it takes, in average, in his hospital, 45 minutes. Then 45 minutes could be crucial for the patient. And also, another thing, at least here in my country, in my, in my hospital, when I, I used to do the procedures in, in the diagnosis department, uh, they are more used to, to do diagnostic procedures, not intervention. Then the anesthesiology facilities, the, the technicians and everybody, they are a little, they don't feel comfortable when there is a complication. Then I think in lesions that you think you have complications like central lesion, hypervascularized tumors, I think so. I think if you have an equipment like this, I think it, it, the things will be better when, whenever occur in comp a complication. But for, uh, no, it's not so so frequent to have complications, fortunately. Yeah, I agree with you. But I think the for for the people starting, you know, ablation of renal tumors, the good planning using even CT or ultrasound, good planning mm -hmm. treatment is the key. And it should really start, any procedure should start with the uh, questions and, uh, and uh, evaluation of the needle track um, uh, before, you know, even, you know, even putting any needle inside mm -hmm. the patient. So please take your time, consider the situation, consider the approach and uh, consider also any kind of structure in between and uh, including, of course, bowel structures, um, vessels in the kidney uh, to avoid complications. Um, there's agree. another one. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, there's I totally agree. One. Uh, there's a role for CUS for monitoring uh, patients after treatment instead of CT to avoid loss of uh, renal function, adverse contrast reaction, and exposure to ionizing radiation. So, uh, Yes, of course, in principle, uh, uh, CUS can be used uh, for uh, uh, the follow-up, as you mentioned, uh, for all the reasons. But, uh, um, you know, follow-up is not only local. And uh, uh, in the case of uh, ambiguous uh, pattern at CT and, ultra and uh, MRI, then we use CUS to solve, you know, the situation. But uh, CT and MRI provide uh, much overall assessment, including uh, you know, adrenal glands, uh, pancreas, um, subcutaneous nodes or perirenal nodes uh, that you can be missing if you do only doing contrast enhanced ultrasound. So in my vision right now, um, we are mostly using CUS as a problem solver uh, in the case of CT and, and, and MRI. And there's a very good situation or very good uh, case when you have arteriovenous fistula, which is not so in, uncommon if you're doing any uh, um, interventional procedure in the kidney. And these uh, uh, arteriovenous fistula will induce very strange pattern at CT and MRI. And they're so obvious at ultrasound, uh, not even CUS, but just conventional Doppler ultrasound that it is useful having um, uh, ultrasound evaluation uh, after the procedure in the case of uh, um, abnormal enhancing pattern. So uh, thank you very much to all of you. It was a great pleasure uh, moderating the session. Thank you very much, Carlos and uh, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, I think we got very nice uh, uh, returns from uh, uh, the audience and maybe uh, uh, we can close the session right now. Thank you very much, Canon, for organizing this symposium. And I think that uh, it's really uh, uh, feeling the need of uh, continuous education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Correas. Uh, that brings us to the end of day four. 
Uh, I'd like to thank again our speakers and moderator, Dr. Carlos Abad, Professor Catherine Roy, and Professor Jean-Michel Gorias. Excellent presentations, very interesting, and also thank you for the really interesting discussions. And this will be our final evening of the Oncology Days, and we will center the webinar on prostate cancer. Thank you all for joining, and I hope to see you again tomorrow.